into a larger museum. And the first is very easy by signing up for our email newsletter. So uh, there's signed up sheets over by the food at the front door, so please join us and, and we'll keep you in touch with all of our programs. There's committees that you can join that you can help us program future exhibits and uh, performances kind of like this. And you can also become a member. And so we have membership information. And membership is really helping us grow the foundation of this organization. And so um, we are completely 100% privately funded. Um, and our goal is to have this museum be free for everybody. So we don't charge admission and our intention is to never do so so that it's accessible for everyone anywhere. So, without further ado, I'm going to introduce you to Mike Wakeford, who is a New Winston Museum board member and also co-curator or co ah, co-curator of this school, this city. So, welcome, Mike. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks for being here tonight. It's great to see some familiar faces and some new faces for what I think is going to be a, a, another great evening of um, this school, this city uh, programming. Um, I want to start just by thanking um, Joe Pecoraro, who's sitting on the edge of the third row back there, uh, guitar faculty at University of North Carolina School of the Arts. Um, some of his uh, students past and students present will be playing before the, the night is out, along with a, a guitar, alumni guitarists um, from uh, earlier years. Um, and different, and, and who studied under different teachers in the long um, history of the UNCSA guitar program. Um, I'm not the expert in the room at all about the guitar program, uh, but fortunately for us, we have uh, we have several uh, that are. And so part of our program tonight, in addition to some wonderful music um, with which we'll start, will include uh, Pat Dixon, um, an alum, an alumnus of. Um, of the relatively early years of the program studied with Jesus Silva, who was the faculty member who started the program, hand-picked um, and, and, and suggested to uh, uh, Vittorio Giannini by none other than Andres Segovia um, as, a, as a great person to begin um, this program here, that at the time, and I just confirmed this with, um, with Joe Pecoraro, at the time, having a guitar program at a conservatory wasn't, uh, wasn't just the usual thing to do. Joe said it was probably only one or two uh, programs at the conservatories at the time that had guitar programs. So when th this, this program not only just has, has a, a special reputation through the years, but it really has, has a you know, almost singular uh, place in the history of, of conservatory level guitar uh, training. Um, and I, I think that that's, I, I think, you know, more insights into the early years of the program or something that Pat will uh, share uh, in a few moments. Um, I'm, I'm holding, actually, a notebook that Joe handed me when he came in here, which is full of fascinating material, and I'm sure he'd be happy, I think he brought it, because he'd be happy for anybody to peruse through it um, at the end of the evening. It actually has some, uh, some uh, archival material, including handwritten letters from Andres Segovia, who I assume everybody knows who I'm talking about, but, but Segovia is the, is the figure um, who um, is most responsible in the second, well, the 20th century for popularizing uh, classical uh, guitar um, and, and, and bringing it to uh, you know, massive new audiences. And so, uh, but this is a handwritten letter, uh, there are several in here from Segovia to Giannini talking about first a, a master class that he was uh, planning to, uh, that he was scheduling to come into Winston-Salem and do a master class and there's other correspondence and material about when he came back for another visit and when he came back for an honorary PhD in the mid-1970s, so fascinating things and just a reminder of the um, of the, the way in which this, in particular, the guitar program at the School of the Arts, really makes contact with the, the most, uh, with the, just the highest echelon of, of, of the field, um, and, and, and really makes it a remarkable, um, well, it, it, it's part of why it's such a remarkable thing, thing and program to have in this city. Um, that, I, I, won't say, I won't say more than that because I think others will fill in um, some historical context uh, about the program. Um, uh, better than I soon enough, uh, and, and definitely others are going to be more musical than I. So um, you all have a program. If, you don't, if we ran out of programs and you don't have one, don't be sh I, I, I'm going to trust that your neighbors will be happy to share them with you. We have a, we have a basic sequence of how, the e how we think the evening will unfold uh, here. I think, I, I think we're all in agreement that this need not be an extra formal affair. And so since there will be a transition between players, you know, different players will need a little time to set up and, and get themselves situated. Um, let's just say now that you're, you're, you should feel welcome to, during those transition times, 
times, you know, raise your hand, ask a question, make a comment, um, and you know, I'll tell you if it's time to be quiet again. But you don't, you don't need to worry about it. Just have a good time and, and ask ask questions. And I think there are you know people in the room who who, who will have uh, have answers and, and be glad to to field questions. So um, so we have a, a sequence of players um, and sequence of, of talkers. Pat's not going to play, but she's going to she's going to talk. But we're going to start. Uh, and, and, and it doesn't go in chronological order per se, but, but Pat's going to talk about, talk, talk about some early years and the very last performance of the evening is, is by three current uh, students in, in um, Professor Pecoraro's stu guitar studio currently. So there is, I guess, a, something of a narrative uh, form here. Um, so we're going to start the evening with Colin Alred, um, who is going to uh, start with, uh, with one piece called African Iris, and um, I'll let him introduce himself to you. Thank you. All right, so uh, African Iris is a piece that I, um, I guess I would say sort of composed, uh, inspired by a uh, piece of traditional kora music uh, performed by Tumani Jabate, and kora is a 21 string uh, harp from West Africa, from a country called Mali. And uh, what I have sort of enjoyed doing since I've been out of school is using the classical guitar technique um, in improvisatory ways. And what's been really inspiring about um, West African string music to me is that's exactly what it is. It's, there's certain premises um, that facilitate improvisation. And so there are aspects of this that are sort of composed, and then there are aspects of it that are just up to the moment. And uh, so I hope you enjoy. It's called African Iris. <laughs> Thank you. 
share with you is also some uh, of the studies that I've been doing of uh, music of different cultures and applying classical guitar technique to those uh, studies. And there's another West African harp uh, that's called the Kamale Ngoni. And uh, it's kind of like the guitar is uh, here. It's almost associated with this sort of like youthful rebellion uh, over in West Africa. And it's more of a folk instrument and it's all pentatonic. Uh, and, and for musicians that's uh, a five note scale and uh, which is a lot of the music from the Wasulu tradition of, of this pentatonic harp is said to be sort of the, the genetic uh, roots of the American blues. And, um, but yet when you listen to the African, the pure African music, it has its own sound. It doesn't really sound like Delta blues. It has certain idiosyncrasies about it, um, certain ornamentation. And so I'm gonna sort of reference some of those studies of uh, simulating pentatonic music from West Africa and then also some uh, Afro-Brazilian rhythms, uh, like the Samba de Roda, um, different, different rhythms that I'll study from, uh, from Brazil um, that also have to do with um, the African peoples moving throughout the world uh, for the reasons of slavery and, um, and creating new genres of music. And um, so yeah, this doesn't have a name. I'm just gonna play something for you. <laughs>
came to live in Salem in 1976 to study with Yusuf I was really looking for a teacher that came from the traditions of Latin American guitar since I had started playing when I was about six years old. And I really wanted to study with someone who understood that style of music. So um, when I heard that the School of the Arts had a wonderful teacher named Jesus Silva, I thought, what can go wrong with going to study with Jesus? So anyway, I have a story to tell you. Um, I actually feel that the most important part of my training occurred at the School of the Arts. And my degree from the School of the Arts is more important than the degree that I got from UNCG. And I was very lucky to be in a place that fostered the arts and its sensitivity in all sorts of ways. Uh, I not only was a guitar student, but I also toured with the first um, touring group from the uh, drama school. And we did a show called um, Fantasy Roulette. And we were like 17 students, and we had this huge arch that we had to put about 300 bolts in it. And that was this sort of like an arch that came in and we had to get up at 6.30 in the morning to get to a school, get this really difficult thing into the school, and then start putting those little bolts. So we had to do that three times a day. It was a really difficult thing to do. So to me, the School of the Arts is like my home. I've always uh, enjoyed having the best of the two, Wake Forest University and the School of the Arts. But today I really want to talk about Jesus because he's a really fantastic teacher. And Jesus really, like uh, Michael said, came at the request of uh, Janini through uh, Andres Segovia. And Jesus actually was already in New York uh, doing a program there at the um, uh, Brooklyn Music, I think, uh, Brooklyn School of Music. Yeah, Brooklyn School of Music, <laughs> that's right, 62, that's right. Mm -hmm. So he came here in 1965, and I came here in actually 1976, so I caught the last four years of the Seuss. But I met all the guys and all the gals that were there before I came, because they were just showing up all the time to visit Jesus. Jesus was like their father, okay? So in his 80th birthday, he decided, uh, we all decided that it was a good idea to put together a testimonial from all the students that were around and that we would send letters to him and we created this little book over here. And his 80th birthday, we gave it to him. And also I was very privileged to have actually featured Jesus in a program when he was 80 years old, a solo program at Wake Forest University that was very well attended, and he played beautifully at 80 years of age. Now, I can't understand that because most people are done by the time they <laughs> get 70 or 75, but Jesus really had the stamina and had the artistry and the musicianship that held him until his very late, late days. Uh, I was the last person who saw him before he died, and I was the last person that actually uh, had a lesson with him. He was in his deathbed, and he was still teaching me. Okay. So I want to read a few things from this. Um, I, I want to say that after he left the School of the Arts in 1979, he went to the uh, University of Virginia Commonwealth, and they set up a scholarship there. So many students are still profiting from that scholarship. Uh, I think they give four scholarships a year to study. So we all contribute to that as, as we, we are requested to, to do. And also I want to say something about the guy that actually started all of this. His name is, uh, let me get my glasses so that I can see. <laughs> His name was uh, Francis Perry. And I'm going to read you what he said. Dear Jesus, the times I spend with you at NCSA are the most precious in my life. Deciding to attend NCSA and study with you was one of the best decisions I have ever made. I almost did not even know about the guitar program there except for a simple twist of fate. In the fall of 1970, I was attending Swarthmore College near Philadelphia, and I decided I wanted to transfer to a music school. 
Through various events, I was prolonged committed to attend Peabody. Just weeks before I was to leave Swarthmore, I was told that there was another serious classical guitar among the students and that I should meet her. Her name was Lucy Davis, who it turns out had gone to NCSA during high school and had studied with you. I told her I was transferring to Peabody and she said, don't go to Peabody, <laughs> go to NCSA and study with Jesus Silva. I think those are the only two sentences she ever said to me. <laughs> there can hardly have been two sentences that had such a profound positive and effect on my life. As a result of her recommendation, I wrote to Winston Salem and I auditioned for you. Then I sat on a master class and spoke afterwards with Tony Hauser, who by the way is in Minnesota, great artist, and John Pakula, who is also in Virginia. Every impression I had of the guitar program in the school was exhilarating. I didn't take, it didn't take me long to decide to come to NCSA, and you were gracious enough to allow me to transfer in the middle of my academic year. It was a distinct privilege to join the family of souls who had gathered about you for insight and inspiration. Shortly after I arrived at NCSA, Maestro Savoia came for a master class, which was incredible. I was there too. Highlights after that included a class in Virginia with John Williams and two summer trips to Italy. All these wonderful experiences happen because of your stature within the guitar world. My weekly lessons during that time were a constant source of learning and inspiration. I try to pass along to my students at least a hint of the world of expression and artistry which you presented to us in lessons and classes. Just one more vivid memory I would like to include here. In 1975, I had the good fortune to play privately for Maestro Segovia in his hotel room in Greensboro. Just minutes after that trial by fire, or praying in front of the Pope, as you like to describe it, <laughs> there was a knock on the hotel door, and we opened it to see your wonderful and reassurance presence there. Just about the most welcome sight I could have imagined under the circumstances. As I type this, I'm looking at my fo the photo of yourself, Maestro Servovia, and me, which was taken at that time, and which has a prominent place on my desk, just as his picture with Segovia is on my desk too. <laughs> As you already have deducted from some of the other letters, I'm the one who contracted the others to contribute to this gift for you on your 80th birthday. One of the reasons why I took the initiative is that I have had a few favorite students who have done quite well for themselves, musicians, and from whom I have not heard in quite a while. I thought, I bet Jesus doesn't hear from some of his former students who really ought to be in touch, especially since he continues to have such a powerful effect on their lives through the years. Well, what a better occasion, your 80th birthday. So, we all contacted you and said we love you, we thank you for everything, and you will always hold you dear to our hearts. And happy birthday. So that was a great letter. But the one that I thought, and there are many here, I, I mean, I could go on and on, but the one that I thought really expresses what Jesus taught us and really the depth of his teaching was this letter, which really says it all to me. And this letter sort of summarizes all the other letters that are here. And this is from Alan Racer. Okay. To Jesus, an inspiring teacher and dear friend. It is hard to believe, as I look back over the nearly 20 years that have passed since we last saw one another, that so much life has all come and gone. You have been an inseparable part of my consciousness and my spirituality, as well as an ever-present force in my music. And now, on the occasion of your 80th birthday, can it be so? I find my thoughts flooded with remembrances and images, sights and sounds of a time when I, as a student, sought to know and experience more than just the ways of our precious love, the guitar, but of life itself. And you were always there, willing, giving, guiding, sharing your own sensitive insights in a way no one had ever done before. Or since, you showed me the way in to the very heart and soul of the music. You helped me to find the time essence that was there, the truth that could not be coerced, but could gently caressed, be caressed to life. Above all, you taught me to listen and to hear and to understand beyond ideas or concepts. To me, it has always been like the passing of a torch, the flame that lights the path 
so that others may find their own way on a magical, mystical journey. I remember the stories, the lessons on living that seem to be as much part of a weekly class as the music itself. And the poetry of Tagoret, Lorca, and others, the art of Raphael and Michelangelo. There was such a rich tapestry of artistic expression and radiance, luminous quality to the moments we share that I will always remember and cherish. I recall the summer of 1977 in Italy, and the warm days and the nights in Assisi, Florence, and Siena, and all the concerts in the magical little towns of Perugia. And the wine, I can still taste the deep, ruby viewed richness of that marvelous vintages we were treated to every day and evening. I still have the bottle of Brunello de Montalcino that we selected one evening before concert time. It is a constant reminder of a special time in my life when so much was being shared, like the legacy of generations before me to be preserved and passed on in turn. The memories are vivid as though it were only yesterday. Time has stood still for me in my recollection of these fragrant chapters of my life. Truly, to have given me more, you have given me more than I have ever adequately repaid. And now I'm honored to be one of the many former students whose lives have been touched by your unique blend of artistic awareness, sensitive insight, and sublime humor. I, it would great. It would please me greatly to know that in this little gesture of remembrance and celebration, I have succeeded in some small degree to convey the love and deep gratitude I feel for you and all you have given me. Happy birthday, Jesus, and may you always know the special comfort and warmth sense of gratification that are your life's rewards, products of the affection and appreciation you so selflessly earned. You are a true teacher, a perennial artist, and a beautiful spirit, and I'm raised. <laughs> yeah. So here you have it, you know, the lessons with Jesus were always magical. I remember there were many pictures in, in his office, and there was one of the side of uh, Hemingway uh, catching a fish, fish and, and he's there, you know, just pulling in there, I'm going to take you in fish, you know? and when things got tough, uh, and you would say, oh, I, I can't get this piece on. He would take you to that picture and say, you see that picture? I will not let you go, you know, until you learn this. But it was in a gentle way. And it was always with the remark that through the guitar, we not only learn just what we can do with music, but we learn about patience. We learn about sensitivity. We learn about diligence. We learn about being consistent. We also learn about being grateful for all the things that we have and all the joys that you, you get through the guitar. And I think that he lived that and he taught it extremely well. So I was very lucky to have been part of that program and I also love the source. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, I think now we move to um, uh, two guitarists who studied at School of the Arts at different times, but uh, now play regularly as a, as a duo, Patrick Louis and uh, Jason Rogers, who I think are coming around the, the bend over here. And they'll probably need uh, just a minute to, to set up, so this would be a, a perfectly good time if anybody has questions um, for either, uh, either Colin uh, or Pat about, um, about where, we've, where we've started. I, mean, I, I, I know I have a question I, I wanted to ask Colin. Um, was you, you, did you say in your introductory comments that were you doing improv up there in part, or were those fully composed pieces that you were playing? Yeah, it was a lot of improvisation inside of a certain context. And, and the context being? Well, um, shift in African music as opposed to like European classical music, like European classical music changes chords a lot and you have like all these journeys of different chord progressions that finally have a cadence and resolve. That's where African music will just pick two chords and you just alternate from this chord to the next chord and there's still a counterpoint between the bass line, the middle line, and the top line, similar to classical guitar, and there's improvisation. So for me, what I was trying to do to assimilate the choral music was was take those two chords, take the scale, 
Hill, which happens to be the Lydian mode uh, in Western music, and uh, and then improvise within that context. So it's kind of like finger skate. You have to do your your spin and land on the chord. You know, it's like um, you do your improvisation and you have to land on the on the chord by the downbeat. And, and so yeah, it's just, it's improvisation within a structure. You do it well. Energetically classical, so you know we do mostly you know well, we do classical music and that's what we do. Um, you know I came here in 1988 uh, after two years of arguing with my uh, teacher in Hong Kong, who is Susan Panagini, uh, in Hong Kong Academy for Performance Arts. And not that I argue with her, it's just that um, every lesson she would uh, tell me to do certain things, and I'll ask her why. And then her answer has always been, well, uh, my former teacher, Aaron Shearer, told me to do this. <laughs> <laughs> and being a very rebellious you know, teenager, you know, I told her, well, if I wanted to know what he has to say, I'd go argue with him instead. <laughs> <laughs> so um, after two years in Hong Kong Academy for Performance Arts, you know, Susan uh, was going to be moving to Spain with uh, her husband. And at the very end, um, you know, of the semester, she handed me an envelope with an acceptance letter from the North Carolina School of the Arts and with a little bit of a scholarship. Um, so that's why I have been here. And with, you know, the thoughts of just staying for six months, and now, you know, since 1988, I've been here, you know, <laughs> until now. So um, Jason and I went to school together, but both of us have studied with Aaron Shearer. So, you know, we are a little bit of a generation you know, after Pat, you know, um, I think Pat graduated in 1980. That's right, yeah, so the same year. Mm -hmm. So eight years later, there's me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, you know, I am also the only, you know, uh, guitarist from School of the Arts here tonight that had worked with uh, another guitarist, Larry Almeida, um, you know, who was um, one of my dearest friends um, a very influential teacher and a wonderful human being. And, you know, I mean, I still thank him, you know, to this day. You know, even though, um, you know, he has moved out west and has not been, you know, teaching, you know, guitar for many years. But, you know, I mean, I have learned a whole lot from him. Uh, tonight, we're going to be playing for you uh, one of the greatest hit, um, the Waltz's Poeticos, you know, by Enrique Granados. You know, the piece originally is written for the piano. And once again, uh, tonight we're going to be doing an arrangement by another former student from North Carolina School of the Arts, a dear friend of mine, Andrew Zone. And you know, this arrangement has been a dream come true. Uh, both Jason and I played this piece by ourselves, you know, and after we start playing this piece as a duet, neither one of us want to ever tackle, you know, the, the piece by ourselves anymore. <laughs> so, um, the, what's this poetical is, in, you know, it's actually eight different voices with uh, an introduction. Uh, after, you know, uh, the introduction, you know, then you are going to hear uh, the melody, you know, of the piece. And then, you know, at the very end, when you hear that melody again, that's, you know, signaling that, you know, we're finally coming to the end. <laughs> <laughs> and it depends on how fast we play. It can be 20 minutes. <laughs> Well, we shall see. <laughs> Thank you. 
dance. I love the idea of uh, a traditional community art form where people are um, encouraged to come out and interact with each other in a way that is structured but that also continues to evolve. I think that that's, that's part of great culture is to have things that we participate in together. So I've been having a lot of fun doing this with Austin. I have been uh, trying to develop the ability to tap rhythmically while I play, so you can <laughs> hear me uh, to do that right now. We're a little bit of a fish out of water here. You have to keep in mind, every time we've played before, we have a room full of amateur dancers that are in need of uh, 
clear, structured beat. So most of the music you've heard here is designed to be listened to in a, in a quiet space that is full of nuance and subtlety. And this is a little more um, kind of designed to be moved to, so it doesn't quite have so much of that, but we try to bring as much as we can and it's part of the problem. Mm. So yeah, so we're gonna do a couple a couple sets and then a waltz. So uh, we're gonna play, start off with a couple versions of a traditional tune called Chink Fin Hunting, followed by the Wren.
those students were called the Divine Rail and Miss DK. So we're gonna finish up by playing a a waltz. So this is an Irish waltz called Star of the County Down. in their own experience with it. Um, I, I haven't had the pleasure of meeting Pacey Silva or Larry Almeida, but I hear lots of you know, wonderful stories about the years before I was even able to meet people here. Um, I think I would be sort of spinning tales if I were to try to make some eloquent connection about pedagogical thread or philosophical thread or artistic thread over the 50 years of the guitar program. It's probably not really true. There's a lot, a lot of really different people who, who've studied here, who've taught here, and who've lived here. So I think the most honest thread that really exists is the theme of this series, the, this town, this, this school, this city series, because I see evidence that the presence of a, a guitar program at UNC School of the Arts has changed to Winston-Salem over the years. And there's evidence that Winston-Salem has really affected the school. Right from the very beginning, guitar program here. Um, I used to run into Phil, Phil Payne's um, from time to time up until just recently when, when he passed away. He loved to tell a story about his friendship with Segovia and he was you know part of a number of people who were instrumental in bringing the school to Winston-Salem. Probably most people know that the story of the school was uh, charged in concept by the state of North Carolina but then various cities bid on who would get to have it 
and a number of people came together to make it possible for it to come here the night of the many phone calls or something. Um, but uh, Phil Haynes would tell me that you know he told Vittorio Giannini, our founding chancellor, that if you're going to have a if you're going to have a conservatory program in Winston Salem, it's going to have a guitar, and we're going to bring in Andre Segovia to to lead it. Um, and, and as Michael said earlier, that was not the norm. You know that, that was not in the conservatory mindset that guitar would be included. And so I think the only ways that that really the only reason that really did happen was somebody who was a, a big supporter of bringing the school here saying that they wanted it to happen, and then somebody having a connection with a really recognized name figure like Andre Segovia to, to get people's attention. Um, and I think ever since then, there's been this really intrinsic connection between guitar music and Winston Salem. I'm constantly meeting people who say that, oh, they remember going to concerts in the 70s and they still love guitar music and it's been a part of their life as a result of the people who visited the school and studied at the school playing for them. We have this amazing group of alumni who have stayed here and built a, a really rich community doing things in all different areas, teaching in schools, teaching privately, performing in all sorts of different venues. People like doing the work like Colin, L.A. Reds down with the Arts for Life program, playing for, uh, for kids. People who brought guitars into the school programs like Patrick Louie and people who teach privately. Um, you know, I think that... Don't forget the society. What's that? Well, there's, there's, there's so many to our school and for our professional musicians, part-time, really active music lovers, I could like, bring this giant list of people. It amazes me when I think of how many people are still in Winston-Salem or in Greensboro or at High Point who have a connection to the school. And I think really music is a force for good in the world. That's why I do what I do. I think guitar has a special place in that because guitar can its effect known in places that some other kinds of art don't. Um, guitar can sort of weasel its way everywhere. Um, and the people who I've had contact with have been a like doing that thing, bringing art and changing people's lives and changing people's experience with guitar and other instruments in some way that is. So um, I always feel like like that. Uh, there's one aspect of the school that hasn't kind of been represented here. So uh, this trio is going to perform for you. I'll take the liberty of introducing them, if that's OK. They're very capable of introducing themselves. But, uh, part of the reason I chose them was as a representative of the high school program that we have at the School of the Arts. Uh, everybody you've heard tonight has been a graduate of our college or graduate program. So these are three students who are all three graduating our high school program this year. Um, and in addition, uh, two of them, Christian Kale here, uh, grew up outside Winston-Salem. And part of the reason I think became interested in the school was through having contact with, uh, with alumni uh, musicians from the guitar program here. And Paul Sessons, who moved here with his mother to, to attend the school before in ninth grade, and now they're you know, part of the community. Um, and there's a number of people since I've been here who grew up in this area, were influenced by people who've had a connection to our school alumni and decided they wanted to be professional musicians and then are now professional musicians. Um, and, you know, this, our school was unique in so many ways being one of the first state-supported conservatory in the U.S., but also undoubtedly the first high school level one in the state-supported arts program, you know. Um, so it's wonderful that all three of these players are from North Carolina and able to attend without any cost for tuition or board. Um, wonderful artists. So this is Paul Sessoms, Gavin Maddock, and Christian Kale. Um, they're going to play two different sets for you. Uh, I've heard it said many times that there are only two kinds of music, song and dance. So we've got a little bit of both tonight. We've had a lot of dance. We're going to have a little bit more. So the first set is a set of Polish uh, dances and a couple of songs. Uh, I first encountered this, this piece by the uh, Polish composer. Uh, Sorotsky from my former colleague, Gerald Flickstein. I don't know where we found this, because I've never seen anybody play this, this piece anywhere else. Uh, but they'll play five short movements on that. And then they'll play a set of very ancient dances by Mikhail Kratorius from the beginning of the uh, 17th century. But then they'll do some variations of their own based on each of the dances. 
kind of connecting this ancient music to modern music that they enjoy listening and playing. And so we hope you enjoy that last set. And it's going a little bit longer than we thought it might, so I don't know if we'll have <coughs> questions or anything. Probably not at the end of this. But, but thanks again, everybody, for coming. Do you want to say anything? Uh, no, I, other than th thanks again. Uh, if there, you know, if at the end there's a there's a, a quick question, we we can take we can take one one or two. But um, but but again, thanks to everybody for for being here. And I, I do want to say, just in case there's not an, an opportune moment, that all, all of those uh, all of those who, who have participated tonight have done so have been generous with their time and energy, and, and I want to acknowledge that we have, we have a, a memento to offer all the, all the players. I want to make sure Catherine is want to make sure that you don't leave without receiving one of our uh, one of our post our exhibition posters, which it has is a beautiful print of of Nick Bragg's mural, which is 18 feet long in reality and is already installed in the. Uh, eventually to open library on campus, uh, a mural called This School, This City. Um, you, the guitar actually managed to find its way into the, into the mural um, right there at the, at the right, right hand. So, so please, players, don't leave uh, without taking, uh, taking your parting uh, gift. And uh, you have our thanks for being here. So thanks.
Anybody have a quick question or co comment to make? For these fellows or Mr. Pecoraro or anything? When does the Contra vote speak? Question about the Contra. Uh, okay. Yes. When do the Contra dance people meet? When do they meet? Um, we meet every Tuesday. Um, the first Tuesday of the month is at Salem College, um, and then in their gym, and then the rest of the Tuesdays of the month we are at the Clemens Civic Club in Clemens. So we're no longer at Vintage Theater. We, we unfortunately we had to leave about a couple years ago, but yeah, we still meet every every week, and on Saturdays. Is it online? It is online. Fiddle and Bow Country Dancers. Is that with Jim Matthews? Is he still with that group, Jim Matthews? I'm not sure if that rings a bell, but I, it probably is, yeah. Is this too small of a space for country dancing? I don't know. Maybe probably three dollars. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.